Inventing Reality. Section. On the Line. Editors. Actual responsibility for daily or weekly news production rests with the newspaper editors and radio and television program producers. Without having to answer to reporters, they can cut, rewrite, or kill any story they choose, subject only to final review by their executive superiors. The top media executives meet regularly with editors and producers in order to keep tabs on story selection. They can recommend or veto a story whenever they like, even overriding their editors. However, since they have other duties, and within their corporation, are supposed to adhere to a division of labor, they most often refrain from imposing their power on a daily basis. As one editor put it, quote, it is not what the executive boss will do or will veto, but what we expect that he will do or veto. That's his influence. End quote. Daily censorship is made unnecessary by anticipatory self-censorship. Many editors insist they are nobody's puppet. Infused with notions of professional integrity and personal autonomy, they will vehemently deny that they are objects of corporate control. Indeed, editors are accorded a certain degree of independence, if they demonstrate their ability to produce what their superiors want, copy that generally does not challenge the interests of those of wealth and power. Editors perform without daily interference from their superiors, because such interference is not necessary. An editor who has to be reined in every day by the publisher will not last long as an editor. But we must not mistake this kind of conditional autonomy for actual autonomy. There is no reason to believe that compliant editors could oppose their publishers even if they wanted to. Since many news editors and broadcast producers share the worldview of their superiors, they seldom experience any ideological dissonance. They are free because they are in perfect agreement with their bosses, and therefore give no cause for being called to account. When an editor resists doing what the publisher wants, then the latter, like the boss of any business organization, is not above ramming his or her dictates down the editor's throat. If they want to keep their jobs, editors learn to swallow. On those relatively rare occasions when it is more than they can swallow, they will resign. The publisher of some local Michigan newspapers wrote a memo provoking his editor to quit. It read, in part, quote, It will be our policy to aggressively support, promote, and report business organizations within our circulation area and or those business organizations who support us with their advertising, end quote. Sometimes editors are not given the choice of resigning and are unceremoniously fired for resisting the owner's directives or for allowing uncomfortable information or dissident opinions to creep into their pages. It is a rare event when a journalistic defender of capitalism stops pretending that he or she is an independent agent, and explicitly admits that a class-power relationship exists in the media. In 1983 and again in 1987, James Kilpatrick, a conservative columnist for the Washington Post and himself a former editor, wrote columns supporting the power of high school and college authorities to censor and suppress student newspapers. To give students, quote, absolute freedom of the press is to let the animals run the zoo, he asserted. Furthermore, in a real grown-up world, an editor is subject to the publisher, and if the publisher says, quote, kill the piece, that's it, sweetheart, the piece is killed. The right of a free press attaches to the guy who owns one. Students do not own a school paper. They have not invested one dime in its production. End quote. Here, Kilpatrick admits, 
indeed, proclaims that, contrary to the established mythology, freedom of the press is not a reporter's political right, but is a prerogative of ownership and wealth. Owners thereby have license to exercise prior censorship over editors. Kilpatrick is right in saying that's how things work in the real world. It is just not often that mainstream commentators announce such truths about the real world. However, if he seriously believes that those who pay should have the final say, then Kilpatrick should keep in mind that most student-run college newspapers are supported by student activities funds. It is the college administrators who, quote, have invested not one dime, but who still claim the right of censorship. Subsection. Editors as intellectual prostitutes. In the early part of the 20th century, the American radical and journalist John Swinton attended a banquet composed of his fellow newspaper editors. When a toast was tendered to the, quote, independent press, Swinton startled his colleagues with this response. Beginning of long quote. There is no such thing in America as an independent press. You know it, and I know it. There is not one of you who dares write his honest opinions. And if you did, you would know beforehand that it would never appear in print. I am paid for keeping my honest opinions out of the paper I'm connected with. Others of you are paid similar salaries for similar things. And any of you who would be so foolish as to write his honest opinions would be out on the streets looking for another job. We are the tools and vassals of rich men behind the scenes. We are the jumping jacks. They pull the strings and we dance. Our talents, our possibilities, and our lives are all the property of other men. We are intellectual prostitutes. Quoted in Sender Garland, Three American Radicals. Boulder, Colorado, Westview, 1991. End of subsection. Editors are more frequently the conduits of, rather than the resistors to, the owner's censorship. Former managing editor of the New York Times, Turner Catledge, notes how he used to pass his publisher's numerous criticisms to reporters and editors as if they were his own so that his staff would not feel, quote, the publisher was constantly looking over their shoulders. In truth, however, he was. End quote. 